Hello, I'm Dr. Sui Hao Chin. I'm a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist specializing in adult heart rhythm disorders. I am based at Blanky Hospital, which is part of the University Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust. So to understand the word SVT or supraventricular tachycardia, let's first take a quick dive into the anatomy of the heart. So the human's heart is an organ consisting of a pair of upper chambers known as the atrium and a pair of lower chambers known as the ventricles. The word supraventricular means that it originates from above the ventricles. The heart beats within a normal heart rate range of 60 to 100 beats per minute. The continuous beating of the heart is due to electrical conduction within the heart. Normal electrical impulse known as the sinus beat originates from sinus node in the top right chamber of the heart, what I refer to as the innate natural pacemaker of the heart. The electrical impulse then travels through the atrium, the top chambers of the heart to reach the midpoint of the heart known as the atrioventricular node, otherwise abbreviated as AV node, since it is located between the atria and the ventricles. The electrical impulse then continues to travel to the lower chambers of the heart. Hence, I normally view the sinus node as the electrical generator, whilst the AV node as a relay station between the atrium and the ventricles. The word tachycardia means a fast heart rate, which technically means a heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute. To put it together, supraventricular tachycardia therefore refers to a fast heart rhythm arising from the top chambers of the heart. Supraventricular tachycardia, more commonly known by its acronym SVT, is an umbrella term which, strictly speaking, includes several conditions. First, it could be sinus tachycardia, which is simply means a, your normal heart rhythm, sinus rhythm going above 100 beats per minute. This could happen as part of a physiological process, for example, due to stress, due to exercise, or it could be inappropriately in other conditions in a particular disease called inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Other more commonly known SVT is the AVNLT, which stands for atrial ventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia, AVLT, which stands for atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, and atrial fibrillation. Due to the complexity of the nature and mechanism, atrial fibrillation is usually considered as a separate disease. The heart requires normal electrical conduction to calm efficiently, thereby ensuring optimal blood flow and oxygen supply to various organs in the body. During a sustained SVT episode, the heart is beating rapidly, as quick as 250 beats per minute, which may compromise circulation to various organs of the body. Having said that, it must be stressed that SVT is actually not a life-threatening condition. However, it frequently causes distressing symptoms and affects patient's quality of life. SVT most commonly occurs by a re-entrant mechanism where an extra connection in a certain part of the heart sets up a short circuit to trigger an SVT episode. In the case of AVNLT, there is an extra connection within the AV node known as the slow pathway. Normal sinus beat conducts through the fast pathway within the AV node. 60% of the population are born with additional slow pathway within the AV node capable of electrical conduction in certain circumstances, what we refer as dual AV node physiology. By and large, this slow pathway does not cause any problem, but for certain people, an extra heartbeat can trigger the electrical connection down the slow pathway, setting up the short circuit within the AV node to cause AVNLT. In the case of AVLT, atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia, the extra connection is not within the AV node, it's outside the AV node and is known as the accessory pathway. 
These accessory pathways are typically located in various parts of the valve, separating the atrium from the ventricle. Some people refer to this condition as Wolf Parkinson White syndrome when the evidence of accessory pathway can be appreciated on an ECG. Depending on the direction of the short circuit, this can be described as antidromic or counterclockwise re-entrant or clockwise, otherwise known as autotromic re-entry. Atrial flutter is commonly regarded in the same family as atrial fibrillation, but technically is also an SVT. In its typical form, it involves electrical conduction which travels in a re-entry manner within the right atrium at 300 bits per minute. This then reaches the AV node, which acts as a sort of gatekeeper, limiting the conduction to the ventricles and thereby typically resulting in a heart rate of 150 beats per minute rather than 300 beats per minute. Less commonly, some SVT occurs due to firing focus in certain parts of the atrium outside the sinus node. When this misfiring occurs in a sustained manner at much faster heart rate, the resulting SVT replaces the sinus rhythm. This is usually the mechanism behind most atrial tachycardia. Figures for SVT are variable by individuals. Well-known risk factors are age of over 65 years and female sex. SVT is five times more common for people above the age of 65 years and twice more common in women. Other reported triggers include alcohol, caffeine, spicy food, stress, and exercise. But most of the time, these triggers can be hard to be discovered. Despite the patients looking hard, there are no identifiable triggers, which go some way to explain the unpredictable nature of the SVT attacks. While patients with SVT may experience a variety of symptoms, there are several commonly reported symptoms. The most common symptoms we encounter is a sensation of anxiety or panic attacks, which could lead to the true SVT symptoms being dismissed when patients first report their symptoms to their doctors. Other patients report the classical symptom of palpitation, which is a sensation of their heart beating. The word palpitation has various meanings to patients. Some will describe palpitation as fluttering, others describe it as miss or skip beats. But in true SVT sense, patients will describe sustained fast heartbeats, and in some cases can literally see rapid pulsation in their chest or neck. Some patients reported shortness of breath, some say that they experience chest discomfort, chest pressure, or chest tightness. Some people also experience sweating or fatigue. In other patients, they may experience lightheadedness or dizziness. And in extreme cases, and I have to stress that these are rare, some patients can lose consciousness. Patients with symptoms of SVT have different thresholds for seeking medical help. In my experience, by and large, this threshold seems to be governed by a few factors. The first factor is the frequency of SVT attacks. In some patients, the SVT attacks only occur once to twice a year with these attacks spontaneously resolved. This patient may decide not to seek any medical help. In others, the SVTs could happen more frequently ranging from weekly to once every few months. This patient should get the SVT diagnosed through wearable heart monitors, what we call holter, of a various duration. Once diagnosed, the patients can then be advised on appropriate treatments. The second factor to consider is the duration of SVT attacks. If the symptoms resolve after a few minutes, then outpatient consultation can be arranged instead. However, if the SVTs last for a few hours, please attend the hospital to get a treatment, but more importantly, to get an ECG record of the SVT. Getting the diagnosis of SVT on ECG will be very helpful for a cardiologist to plan for your treatment. The third factor to consider is the type of symptoms. Now, if palpitation occurs as a form of SVT on its own, this normally can be investigated in the outpatient setting. 
There are certain red flag symptoms include chest pain or chest tightness, shortness of breath, loss of consciousness. These other symptoms should prompt you to call for an ambulance. The final factor and probably the most common reason leading to constipation for SVT is the impact of SVT on the quality of life. Most people dreaded the unpredictable nature of this SVT episode, stopping them from enjoying their life or even going away for holidays. In some cases of SVT with dizziness or fainting, these patients may stop driving until the SVT is diagnosed and treated. If there is any unexplained loss of consciousness, the patient will need to stop driving for a period of time as dictated by the DVLA regulations. There is a hierarchical approach to the treatment of SVT. Depending on the burden and frequency of the SVT episodes, management could range from physiological maneuvers through antiarrhythmic drugs to a procedure called electrophysiology study and catheter ablations. For patients who have rare and short-living SVT episodes, they may not need to do anything if these episodes terminate spontaneously. Sometimes, if there is a recognized trigger, avoidance of the trigger may achieve the effect of preventing further SVT episodes. For patients with infrequent but sustained SVT episodes, this episode could be terminated by physiological maneuvers in the first instance. These maneuvers, sometimes known as the vagal maneuvers, can interrupt the SVT of a short circuit re-entry mechanism. Examples of these maneuvers include pinching your nose and trying to blow your nose with the mouth closed as if you are trying to pop your eardrums, splashing cold water to your face, or blowing against a syringe. If you are not alone, you can ask someone to massage in a circular motion the right side of your neck where the pulse is. This is an approach called parotid sinus massage. It is best to perform these so-called physiological maneuvers while sitting or lying down just in case that patients may experience dizziness. Now, if these physiological maneuvers fail, patients will need to attend the nearest hospital for an intravenous injection of a drug called adenosine to terminate the SVT episodes. For more resilient SVT, the doctor may even initiate an intravenous drip of an antiarrhythmic drug. What must be emphasized here is that if you end up having SVT in the hospital, please do get an ECG record of the SVT, since this will greatly aid the SVT diagnosis and treatment by your cardiologist later on in the outpatient clinic. However, the physiological maneuver and the intravenous treatment at the emergency department only serve as a temporary measure to terminate the SVT episode. To prevent future SVT attacks, patients may be given the option of either having antiarrhythmic drugs as a pill in the pocket approach for use during SVT episodes or having regular antiarrhythmic drugs. The antiarrhythmic drugs most commonly used are beta blockers. This could be readily prescribed by your GP. For those who cannot take beta blockers, they could use a drug called calcium channel blocker. For more efficacious and specialized antiarrhythmic drugs, this will require a referral to a cardiologist. More importantly, nowadays we could perform a procedure called electrophysiology study and catheter ablation to cure the SVT with a success rate as high as 95%. This is a procedure that is done as a day case using sedatives only. It involves us freezing the top of your leg, typically the right joint where the skin crease is with local anesthetics. We then pass three or four short tubes into the vein at the top of your leg. Through these short tubes, we can pass wires or catheters up the legs to different areas of your heart. This is a safe procedure done with the passage of the wires under X-ray guidance. To perform an electrophysiology study, we stimulate the heart through these wires to assess electrical conduction within the heart and to attempt to induce the SVT. Once the SVT starts, we can perform various maneuvers to confirm the diagnosis of SVT. To treat the SVT, we then pass an ablation catheter from the top of your leg to the heart to perform cauterization of the heart tissue responsible for the SVT episode. 
The cauterization or in technical term radio frequency ablation is generally not painful. Most patients don't feel any pain during the ablation. In fact, what they do feel is when the SVD is deliberately initiated during the initial electrophysiology study. This is a procedure that is done under special x-ray guidance called fluoroscopy, but for some cases we use sophisticated 3D mapping system to help us pinpoint the location of the SVD to deliver the ablation. Once the ablation is delivered, we then confirm the effectiveness of the treatment by repeating the electrophysiology study to ensure no further SVT can be induced. The overall complication rate from this type of procedure is extremely low at 1%. In summary, SVT is a highly curable condition by catheter ablation with a high success rate and a low procedural complication rate. Patients are generally discharged from the hospital the same day. Sometimes your physicians may decide to let you stay overnight just for monitoring.